Hammond and Penny Law, Dr. Penny Law, and uh, I'm the convener for the Geography and Adventure Program. We're delighted to see so many of you in the audience, uh, the members of the Bath Royal, fellows of the Royal Geographical Society, and uh, in particular, and uh, members of the general public, I hope you'll join us here at the Bath Royal. Future uh, uh, program. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Philip Beale to you. Philip is a, a, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Uh, he's a keen historian. He is a wacky great adventurer. Uh, he is a practical and experimental archaeologist uh, because he believes. Uh, in the tradition of Thor Heyerdahl, that it is only when you have actually, you know, built the boat, actually donned the clothes, actually made the journey, that you can really uh, experientially uh, discover and appreciate the extraordinary, uh, the extraordinary history and truths, uh, feelings, emotions, and uh, uh, adventures that the early explorers went through. Philip, uh, who has a distinguished history in exploration and experimental archaeology, will be talking to us about his uh, uh, his journey uh, to investigate whether or not, and hopefully to prove to us uh, that the Phoenicians actually arrived in America before Columbus was said to have discovered that continent. So I will turn over uh, to Philip now, who will lead us through. Now, when he, Philip has had an opportunity to finish speaking, uh, we'll have questions from the floor. I hope you'll have lots of lovely questions to ask Philip. We have an online audience as well, and uh, some of them may be choosing to use the chat function, and uh, there'll be an opportunity. I'll try and come around with a uh, microphone. Otherwise, I would ask you to speak up and be clear. And please, no strategies for deploying power, just a question that actually addresses what Philip has been talking about. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Law, for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, can't wait to hear myself speak after that uh, very kind introduction. Um, but it's a delight to be here to present to you my sort of theory, philosophy, that the Phoenicians have got a good claim to make to eventually reach the Americas before Columbus, before the Vikings. And uh, tonight I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, nothing like a little interruption to uh, sort of uh, break break the, uh, the the nerves, so to say. So I was just telling you a little bit about the Phoenicians, and uh, apologies for those online that didn't hear it. But I'm just going to recap uh, a little bit about the Phoenicians before we get into the story, which we're going to break down into three parts, partly about the ship, partly about what the ancients knew of the outer ocean, as they, they called it, and uh, the voyage itself. So just to recap a couple of minutes, uh, the Phoenicians were these great people. They were uh, effectively a group of city-states from Tyre in the south of Lebanon, Sidon, Byblos, Beirut, up to Arwad, in modern-day Syria. And they became known as the, the purple people because they discovered this purple dye that is made from the gland of the, the murex shell. And that, in ancient times, was worth more than its weight in gold. Uh, a few other facts about the Phoenicians. They were the world's first global traders. They were trading on three continents, Asia, Africa, and uh, Europe. If you had a crafty glass of white wine this evening before you came here, you should thank the Phoenicians. They introduced white wine into Europe. They introduced olive oil. Our modern day alphabet is uh, derived from the Phoenicians. Uh, they were great uh, craftsmen, metal workers, goldsmiths, silversmiths. 
and they uh, imported industrial quantities. I mean, industrial quantities of metals from Iberia and from the southwest of England to the Middle East that in ancient times was always short of, uh, of metals. Mm -hmm. And the thing that perhaps made them the most successful traders was they were great at building ships, they were great sailors, but they were also great navigators. And they have a claim to make us one of the greatest uh, navigators. They discovered the Pole Star. So they always knew where north was. And from that, they could determine north, west, south, etc. So great navigators. And uh, the last thing I should just mention about them is that they lived, uh, as I say, or the the uh, the civilization lasted till about 146 BC, and you may remember that date. That is the date that Carthage uh, was destroyed by the Romans after three Punic Wars, and basically, the story of Carthage, in terms of legend anyway, is that the daughter of the king of Tyre, uh, Queen Dido, fell out with her father. She and eight sea captains left from Tyre and eventually arrived in some land in modern day Tunis and Tunisia. And the new town, as Carthage is, is the translation for, uh, was, was born. And Carthage became the center of the Phoenicians' activities in the Western Mediterranean and became such a threat that the Romans, I mean, you may remember that quotation, I think uh, Julius Caesar said, Carthage must be destroyed, and eventually it was destroyed, but not before the Phoenicians had uh, set up the city of Cadiz on the Iberian Peninsula, had established colonies in Marbella and, and uh, Gibraltar and many other uh, places that we'll see. So that is, if you like, the, the background to why the Phoenicians were so powerful and strong, and indeed the strongest really of the uh, ancient maritime powers. So what was my inspiration then for this voyage? Um, so this is the inspiration for the um, my, my interest in whether the Phoenicians could have reached the Americas. This is a rock drawing from a cave uh, called Laja Alta, uh, which overlooks uh, the Bay of Gibraltar. And you can see here this big sail, uh, oars, uh, a prow and a stern here. And clearly, my thinking was, if these big ships, and this has been dated to the 7th and 9th century BC, exactly the time when the Phoenicians were colonizing Gibraltar and Cadiz. And if these ships were sailing through the Strait of Gibraltar, then surely they would have managed to get out into the Atlantic and beyond. So that was my, uh, my, my sort of inspiration. And I decided many years ago that I would do this voyage and we would take the boat from Carthage to Gibraltar and Cadiz down to Mogador, which is in uh, Morocco at Essaouira. And that was one of the other great Phoenician trading posts. And then we would uh, take, uh, go to the Canary Islands, which archeologists have relatively recently confirmed that the Phoenicians traded with uh, the Canary Islands. And then we would literally just let the ship sail uh, not quite by itself, but not have any predetermined destination, just so that we could experiment and see where we would end up. So that was the plan. And uh, I'll now just talk you through how, how the ship was actually built. The ship was based on a wreck that was found in the 1990s called the Jules Verne 7. It uh, was a Phoenician stroke Aegean ship dated to 600 BC, which was the date we chose that we wanted to um, uh, have as our sort of key point uh, in, in terms of the 
the, this particular vessel. And we built uh, the ship using only traditional timbers that were available in the ancient times. And we built the vessel exactly as they would have done. And that was all based on this uh, wreck that was excavated um, near, near Marseille. Here you can see uh, the, the keel uh, that's been laid, and we've got the tenons coming out to join, to join the planks. And in this next slide, we can see here these little um, mortises here, which is where the tenons are going to fit in. And just here, these dowels that are going to be pushed into the, the planks, they are going to lock those tenons in place. So when the ship goes in the water, it's, the, the timbers are going to swell up and it's going to really squeeze tight the, the planks against each other to create a really strong and robust hull. And unlike you know, the Arab dowels that needed a lot of caulking, a lot of uh, cotton and um, resin, the Phoenician ships didn't need that because they really pioneered this, what we call the mortise and tenon joint. The Romans called it the Phoenician joint because this was, if you like, a new development, a new technology in shipbuilding. And I have got uh, right here, I've got an example of how these planks and the pegs link together. And I'm going to hand this around so you can see it, but you'll not be surprised to see that this is a really strong piece of carpentry. And imagine that you have this on a 60 foot uh, ship. Uh, and as many as uh, 8,000 joints like this. And the Phoenicians, not content with their Phoenician joints, they started to use, and were pretty much the first shipbuilders to use iron nails to actually reinforce the planks and hold them, uh, uh, tie them into the ribs. So I'll hand these around so you can get a feel for those as well. Oh, sorry, you I do apologize. Uh, I was talking about a slide that you couldn't really see. Sorry, this, this is the slide which I mentioned where the, the, the tenons go in these gaps at the top. And this is where the, the dowels um, are pushed in and lock the tenons in place. And then, as I say, when the timber swells up, it makes a really tight joint. Do, do shout to me if, if my slide does not keep. I actually could see that. Could oh, you could see it, yeah. but it just disappeared. All right. So the boat was built in Syria, in Arwad, which is one of these. It's a little island off the coast of Syria, so opposite uh, Cyprus, if you like. And uh, it was the only island that, or only group of traditional wooden boat builders that exists on the uh, eastern Mediterranean coast. And I wanted to have the boat built in an ancient Phoenician port for sort of authenticity, if you like. And this is the boat, the shell of the boat. Um, and the point here is this is built shell first. And this is the ancient way. They, if you like, had a canoe to begin with, and then they built the planks up further. And only later uh, did they add in the ribs. So it's a real work of art. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a very strong hull in itself, but then it's reinforced with lots of ribs. Um, because, you know, nowadays you, you do the skeleton first and then you tack the planks on sort of afterwards. The ancients did it the other way around and we had to teach the boat builders how to do this. And the final product looked like this. Here's the boat, beautifully shaped. Uh, this is the first time it's gone into the water. Uh, it's not fully um, fledged, but uh, you get the idea um, of the boat as it went in the water, first of all. And um, 
just so you can get an idea now of what she looks like when she's actually sailing, I'm just going to show you a, a little clip of her sailing. Before we did this voyage, we recreated the voyage that Herodotus talked about, the Phoenicians being the first to circumnavigate Africa. And we did that from 2008 to 2010. It took two years and two months to, to do that voyage. And this clip I'm going to show you is the Phoenicia sailing back from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean, into Gibraltar. So it just gives you a little bit of a flavour. For those sailors amongst you, you can see it's a little bit like sailing with a spinnaker. And anyone you know who sailed with a spinnaker knows that as soon as you get the wind changed direction, if your helmsman's not paying attention, all of a sudden the sail is being backed and you're in all sorts of chaos and trouble. So um, she's not an easy boat to sail. She's heavy, 50 tons, um, and, and difficult to manoeuvre, but, um, but when you are actually sailing it and it's going well, it does really feel like you are sailing in an era, you know, two and a half thousand years ago. So I'm now just going to turn to the sort of second part, really, of my presentation, which is what did the ancients know about the Atlantic? And uh, I'm going to start by just running through some of the key uh, scholars from the ancient period. And I've lined them up for you. You all know, I'm sure, of Pythagoras, uh, his geometry, algebra, and I include him because he was a Phoenician. I only include him for that, for that reason. But there were many very skilled and knowledgeable Phoenicians. Aristotle wasn't a Phoenician, of course, but the reason I mention Aristotle is because we all know him really as a, as a writer and a philosopher, but actually he was the first person to scientifically demonstrate that the world was round. He observed that certain constellations in the heavens could not be observed from a single point. You had to travel many, many miles to see certain constellations. And he also observed that as a ship went out of a harbor and gradually disappeared, it clearly didn't suddenly disappear in one go. There was clearly a curvature to the earth. So the ancients knew the world was a sphere. It is a complete myth that they thought they would uh, fall off the edge of the world um, the educated people in the ancient world knew the world was round. It was, and it's certainly true, that in the Middle Ages, sailors believed they could um, fall off the edge of the world. It was a myth that uh, got propagated because of the Dark Ages, a lot of knowledge was lost. But uh, the ancients knew better. Now, I move now to uh, Eratosthenes. He was one of the cleverest gentleman of his time. He was the chief librarian at the Alexandria 
uh, library. He was in charge of 150 librarians. And he did an ingenious experiment to calculate the circumference of the world. And uh, by various means, which I haven't really got time to go into, he calculated that the circumference of the Earth was approximately 25,000 miles. He was within 3% of the actual distance. It's a very clever guy. Hipparchus had a slightly different take on things. He spent his whole life plotting the positions of towns and cities from the capital of China right the way through to the Atlantic. Uh, some 8,000 towns and cities he plotted, but also constellations and, and stars as well. And he was really known as the details person in terms of giving precise, as, as they could, the distances between various um, various towns and cities and points in the world, and, and giving us the, the length, if you like, of the known world. Then came along um, Marinus of Tyre. Now, Marinus of Tyre, of course, with the name Tyre attached to him, he was a Phoenician. Uh, well, he had a Phoenician mother, but a Greek father. The Greeks generally claim Marinus of Tyre as one of their own. I'm sort of happy about that because Marinus made a terrible mistake. He re-ran the experiment using a different technique, and he believed that the world was actually only 18,000 miles in terms of circumference, about a third less than it actually was. And he was, he was a, a, a great uh, a geographer, really. I mean, he was the first to create a grid of longitude and latitude. He even was the first to name uh, the Antarctic. So he was, you know, really quite ahead of his time, even though he made this terrible mistake. Ptolemy came along and basically he did criticize uh, Marinus of Tyre to some degree, but he basically endorsed the measurement. Now, why is that important? Well, uh, Ptolemy did this uh, treatise called Geographia, and in the 15th century, 1476, I think, uh, it was published, it was translated and published throughout Europe. Columbus got a copy of this uh, uh, treatise, and he took the measurements that Ptolemy had said. He thought the world was a lot smaller than it actually was. In fact, Columbus made it worse. He said Marinus of Tyre had made a mistake. He hadn't included some Chinese islands, and therefore the world was actually shorter or smaller in circumference terms than Ptolemy had said. And therefore, you know, what we're saying is Columbus believed that within a few weeks he could sail from Spain and reach, as he put it, Cathay, which was Japan, China, and India, in a matter of weeks, clearly not realizing that the great continent of the Americas was in between him and the Buddhist of the Pacific as well. But he set out to get there, but didn't realize what he was really doing because of these errors. Partly he had made one, but Marinus of Tyre and Ptolemy had, had, had as well. The other reason why this is important is we have the information from Hipparchus. Now, he had calculated very accurately, if you like, the length of the known world. But Ptolemy's understanding of the length of the, the world, if you like, if, in terms of uh, longitude, was seriously short. And that there's a, a map that you can you know, see on the internet, Ptolemy's uh, map. He's, he's fudged the, the drawing of the, uh, of the United Kingdom. He, he draws it basically from west to east. It goes sort of, England goes across the, the, the North Sea because he's trying to fix this problem. But Hipparchus, basically says that the known world is three and a half thousand miles beyond what we would now say is the Canary Islands. In other words, Hipparchus is saying there are some islands well out into the Atlantic. And there are three 
um, ancient writers, Sertorius, uh, Seneca, uh, and Sabosis, who talk about these outer islands called the Hesperides Islands that took 40 days of navigation. And Seneca uh, recalls some sailors coming back from a voyage of 40, um, of, uh, 40 days of navigation. So here are some glimpses that the ancients actually knew and visited these islands, um, which are almost certainly in, in the Caribbean. Let me just add a bit more to that. You may also be familiar with Strabo. Strabo was considered the father of geography. He wrote really the first long uh, exposition about geography. And he says that along this coast here, there were 300 Phoenician settlements, 300. Now, that may be a, a gross exaggeration, but imagine uh, if it was only 50 trading settlements. We know about Cadiz, we know about uh, Mogador, but imagine just for 50 settlements for trade, how many boats and ships you're gonna have on this coastline. Uh, even as, as I say, assuming Strabo was exaggerating. And then you have to contend with this. So this is a chart that was made by the uh, Benjamin Franklin, the one of the founding fathers of America. He observed that the mail ships uh, from the United States arrived in London much more quickly than when on the return journey. So he plotted this, if you like, conveyor belt of the, the currents and the winds, and it became known as, as the Gulf Stream. If you're there sailing off the coast of West Africa or Iberia, and of course, yachts at this time of the year come out of the Mediterranean, and what do they do? They pick up this Gulf Stream and, and take it across to the Caribbean for the winter. So this is pretty obvious stuff. So it's relatively easy for the Phoenicians to get across to these islands I've just mentioned. But what else was going on in the Atlantic at this time? Well, let me just pinpoint two or three points. Uh, 200 years ago, a cache of Carthaginian coins were found in the Azores on the island of Corvo. And a Swedish commission in the 1960s confirmed that they believed this was genuine and that the report that uh, a gentleman called Hodlin, who was a Swedish numicist, uh, wrote at the time was, was genuine. So two, sorry, 900 miles into the Atlantic, we have the probability or the possibility, choose, choose it as you will, um, you know, that the Carthaginians were visiting the Azores. And indeed, in some of the textbooks, you know, they, they clearly say that the Azores was known in ancient times. The Portuguese don't like to admit it too much because, you know, they'd rather um, stick with the, their version of events that they discovered it in 1435. So anyway, another example. Now, some of you may know this one. Is that familiar to anyone of you here, these coins? No? Really? Um, I thought there would be at least some of you who would know this. So this is the Carthaginian coin that was found six miles away in Salzburg on the River Avon. Six miles away. And it was discovered by a lady who, um, after a flood on the River Avon in 2012, and the British Museum have come out and confirmed that they believe this is evidence of Carthaginian, of course, you know, Phoenician, I use these terms sort of interchangeably, uh, evidence of trade with the southwest of England. And it's right here on our doorstep. And this is a revelation because I can assure you that 15 or 20 years ago when I started this sort of project, um, 
the British Museum and other museums did not think like this, but this is new evidence. And this is a great thing about archaeology. Every week, new discoveries are being made. And I just want to mention one more. Uh, three years ago, uh, an Israeli group of archaeologists were excavating a wreck that they found off the coast of uh, Israel. They, the, the wreck contained quite a lot of iron ingots in it. And they've traced, I mean, the iron ingots have, or the tin ingots, sorry, have a, um, a signature, if you like, like a DNA, and they've traced those to Cornwall and South Devon. So we have proof, scientific proof, that the Phoenicians were transporting goods over a distance of two and a half to 3,000 miles from the south of England back to the Middle East. So there's quite a lot of activity going on in, in the Atlantic. I should also mention that the Carthaginians were the first recorded sailors in the Atlantic. They had two admirals, Admiral Himilco and Admiral Haino. Himilco did an expedition, quite a big expedition, to northern Europe, and Haino did a massive expedition, we literally, well, according to the records that do survive, that thousands of people uh, supported his expedition on these ships that went down the west coast of Africa, certainly as far as Senegal, maybe as far as, um, as the Cameroons. So a lot going on. You may be wondering then why we don't know more about this. Well, imagine tomorrow, we all wake up and our smartphones don't work and all of our laptops uh, and tablets have ha had their hard drives wiped and there's no knowledge in our computers and machines. We would be thrown back, what, 50 years to the 1980s sort of when none of us had laptops or, you know, there was a, perhaps just the, the glimmer of a BBC micro computer coming along. Well, that is my contention. That's what happened in the ancient world. The vast majority of Western knowledge was destroyed in two parts. The first part was destroyed at Carthage in 146 BC, when the great library of uh, Carthage, which probably held about a third of the world's sort of knowledge at that time, was destroyed by the Romans, to blame them. But then worse than that, this happened. This fire destroyed the great library at Alexandria. And so within a couple of hundred years, two of the greatest libraries that were on, you know, in the Western Hemisphere were destroyed. All of that knowledge. There was uh, some knowledge, uh, a li another library at Constantinople, but that was mainly in, in, in Arabic. And therefore that information didn't easily flow through. So a lot of the knowledge of the ancient world was lost. And that is why we don't know enough about what the ancients were doing. But as I say, there are clues, there are uh, descriptions of voyages 40 days long from, from Iberia. So that's why I believe the, there is a strong case to say that the Phoenicians made that journey. So I'm just concerned a bit about the time, but I don't know how, how are we doing. Quarter by that's, that's not too bad. Quarter of an hour. We're going to do the the actual uh, expedition now. So thank you for bearing with me with the sort of history lesson. But I think it's it's important to understand that there is real sort of theory and sort of knowledge that supports this uh, this project. So what we did we had the ship, we struggled, frankly, to get uh, all the uh, uh, finances and sponsorship, but in the end, we just decided to, to do it and put it on the on the credit card, as it were. Um, and you think I'm joking, it's true. <laughs> uh, a lot of this money went on the, on the credit card. So we got the boat to Carthage, and the Tunisians were absolutely delighted that we'd recognized Carthage as being the appropriate place to start this expedition. Uh, they treated us wonderfully. 
uh, lots of visits to the, the uh, archaeological sites. And, um, you know, as the final day of departure, which was the 28th of September 2019, came, uh, van loads of food and supplies just kept arriving. Uh, and here we are, to, you know, trying to store it all away, um, one of my colleagues. So um, eventually we were, were ready uh, to go. And we set off on a very blustery afternoon uh, into the Bay of Tunis with an international crew. And um, anyway, it, it was pretty choppy, pretty rough, to be honest. About one o'clock in the evening, I get a call from one of our guys who've been fantastic support to us, a guy called Mohammed Ghassan, who is actually the world's expert in purple dye. And he produced that little um, box of um, murex shells and purple dye. He, anyway, is a great support, has a wonderful character. He says, Captain, Captain, uh, I understand that the ship is in danger. Uh, what can we do to help you? And I sort of said, look, Mohammed, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong. I mean, it's, it's rough, yeah, it's, you know. He said, oh, I've just had a call from the wife of one of your crew members. She said she's just got a text message to say the ship is in danger, seek help. So I said, no, no, I can assure you the ship is not in danger. It's okay. Um, I will find out what is going on. So I go down below. I wake up this guy, Doug, who's an American guy. I said, Doug, um, do you have one of these GPS alert things? And have you sent a message to your wife telling her that you think we're going to sink? And he says, no, no, I, I sent a message saying everything's fine. There's no problem. Well, I said, well, sorry, the message you got was that we were in danger and you've nearly started an international search and rescue uh, mission before we've actually got going. Could you please switch off your you know, machine? And he was, of course, very apologetic that he'd done this. But luckily, we were still in radio contact. So it was it was all right. But uh, it wasn't a great sort of start of sort of Anglo-American uh, communications on board, shall we say. <clears throat> but uh, we managed to get the boat out of the Mediterranean. Um, we had some scary moments with the mast. Um, but we then went into Cadiz and there we were welcomed uh, incredibly well and you know it's great to learn of the huge depth of uh, huge depth of um, artifacts and knowledge that is there the Phoenicians and, and you know I could have probably spend a week there looking at all their artifacts and stuff and you know the, in the main National Museum it's absolutely fantastic but we then sailed from there down the coast to Morocco and to uh, Mogador and you can see here, this is a picture taken as we were sailing down, where you know, one of the great inventions of the Phoenicians, um, they could reef the sail whilst the boom was still up. And here you can see we've got these lines going up. We've actually uh, reefed the sail like a, a little bit like a Venetian blind. We've taken it up, so we're spilling this out because there's just too much wind. And if we have too much wind on the sail, it's just going to burst and we're going to have problems. So we've, we're spilling the wind here, but the boat is going as fast as it, as it reasonably can. And uh, in some respects, it's sort of going too fast because there are literally hundreds of little fishing boats five to 10 miles off the Moroccan coast fishing for sardines. And at night time, they are, for a vessel like ours, they're a bit of a nightmare. But eventually we get down to Mogador and um, it's a narrow entrance, but we have this strong northerly wind blowing and we're really worried about actually getting blown on, onto the rocks. So I put one of the crew uh, with a uh, chart plotter and say, look, this is the line. And if we deviate from it, then you need to come and tell us because uh, we don't want to end up on the, on the rocks. So eventually we got into this uh, inner bay in um, Mogador in Essaouira. And uh, we anchor about one o'clock in the morning, exhausted from an afternoon of dodging fishing boats and then sort of avoiding the rocks. And we didn't have a depth sounder, so we just sort of picked our point and dropped the anchor. And then the next morning, we were invited in to the inner harbour 
Uh, and this is us alongside a search and rescue vessel. And you can see now a picture of all these little tiny fishing boats. Um, there are just hundreds of them. And uh, <laughs> the whole place smells of fish. It's, it's amazing. But we really grew to like it. And again, we were welcomed with open arms because, again, we had recognized Mogador and Esawira was one of the key uh, Phoenician trading points. So we then, after um, uh, two or three days, left for the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands, as I said, undoubtedly did have Phoenician contact. They found Phoenician artifacts and the like. So that was quite reasonable for us to call in. And then we decided, yes, we're going to just let the, the, the ship go. And off we went. And um, one of the first visitors that we experienced was this falcon uh, that you can see here. Um, we were 500 miles offshore and a falcon decides to come and bless us with his presence. And here he is, very beautiful. He won the hearts of the crew, crew fed him some food. And um, unfortunately, he didn't have any webbed feet. So one morning, I was on the deck. I saw him fly off. He dived into the water, after, I assume, after a fish, but we never saw him again. So he was out of his depth, I'm afraid. So very sad, but, uh, but that was the yeah, story of our falcon. And then we had another wildlife experience on board. Remember, I said we had lots of stores. Well, one day, one of the guys on board noticed that our store of apples was gradually getting some little, little holes in the side of them. And I put it down to a mouse. I thought, well, okay, it's a little mouse. You know, it's not going to do any harm. You know, just, we're bigger than it. It'll be fine. But then a couple of days later, we discovered that our dry stores, the pasta and the rice, there were those bags were suddenly being opened and, you know, rice was pouring out and we knew it was something a little bit more serious than a little mouse. And then this guy called Max, who was one of the, the bigger, tougher crew members, uh, always joking, said, oh, I saw a rat run across the deck last night. And, but he was always joking, so we weren't sure. And then the next night he said, oh, I saw the rat again. And then eventually I was doing a round just down below, checking, you know, for leaks in the, in the hull with a little torch. And sure enough, I saw this big fat rat jumping along our water containers and our food. So I knew we were in sort of trouble. And of course, you know, the danger was health, safety. You don't want the crew to be bitten and diseases and all that horrible stuff that rats can bring. So it's quite a serious issue. It's got, some of the crew were quite worried. Um, decided to begin with to put the generator on. We, we closed the hatches and tried to smoke it out. And we did that for five hours uh, uh, until we could bear the, the, the diesel fumes no longer. Um, but still, the rat came back. He might have had a headache, but it wasn't dead. So that was for sure. So um, my colleague, uh, Yuri, who's a Brazilian filmmaker on board all the time, great colleague, he was... Uh, you know, experience in, in producing traps in the Amazon. He created this rat trap, to got a sense of humor, the Minnie Mouse nightclub. And he, uh, the first time the rat went in, went out, took the food, went out, and the, the trap didn't work. Second time I went down there, and this, this trap was just vibrating. There was a very angry rat inside. So we, we, he, he went down, picked it up. We put a rope around this, this uh, trap, uh, trailed it behind the boat, for, for about five or ten minutes. We brought it on board and there was, there was no rat to be seen. And uh, we were just all jubilant that uh, we'd killed the rat. But this had been going on for about two weeks. And some people said, you know, they felt it in their hair at night and, you know, they weren't sure and stuff. So, uh, but there was one member of the crew who thought it was very barbaric to, to drown it, but uh, we just wanted to, to get rid of it, you know. So that was the story of the, the rat. Um, we spent Christmas Day at sea, 2019. We've been at sea for, for nearly five five weeks, and we were just uh, approaching. We'd been blown much further south than I thought. We came to Guadeloupe, um, 
And uh, here we've got the international crew, a couple of um, Indonesians, Brazilian I mentioned, a couple of Lebanese, a um, couple of Norwegian um, vi uh, guys who say, sell Viking replica ships, which was an invaluable experience. Uh, we had a Dutch doctor on board, this lady here. Um, so that was the crew. And we all got on. There was quite a lot of good debates to be had at night um, and, and the like. So we hadn't really made any plans as to where we were going to uh, make landfall because that wasn't the point. We came to uh, right by Guadalupe, but we decided as we had some contact in the Dominican Republic, we would make landfall there. And at very short notice, the uh, Dominican Republic Navy uh, said, yeah, you'd be most welcome to come. We will host you in uh, Santo Domingo. And um, they, you know, turned on the charm. They, they brought out the, the brass band and uh, they gave us board and lodgings and hospitality for, for three weeks. Um, and they were, you know, absolutely fantastic hosts. And again, there are many people uh, who believe that the Phoenicians reached uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, and it was sort of fitting in a way because that's where Columbus made his headquarters. And I'll just mention a little bit about Columbus, if I may, if you'll forgive me. But, you know, Columbus obviously started the age of discovery. So, you know, after 1492, European capitals, you know, were buzzing with plans for exploration for these new lands and, and new opportunities and commerce. And that was, was great. But on the negative side, he unleashed, you know, terrible brutality. So um, tens of thousands of, you know, Arawak and uh, Taino Indians were killed by his soldiers uh, in, in certainly in, in Hispaniola, as Dominican Republic and Haiti was then known. And um, he was really the grandfather of the American European slave trade. He on his second voyage, uh, sorry, third voyage, no, second voyage, um, second voyage, he, he brought back to Europe 500 uh, Arawak Indians, of which 200 died on the voyage. So, and on his third voyage, there's such brutality that he unleashed on the, on the inhabitants of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, he was imprisoned. Uh, he was sent back in chains. And he was imprisoned in Spain for six months because uh, his fellow uh, observers had, had, had reported back to the king and queen of Spain just how barbaric and how terrible his soldiers had been. So, you know, positive from a sort of commercial point of view, but his legacy is not um, that good. Anyway, I just put that in there. Um, for, for balance, shall we say, and it's particularly relevant in this day and age. Um, we then proceeded. Uh, there was quite a lot of interest in America in our voyage, so we then took the ship um, between Haiti and Cuba up towards Miami and um, Fort Lauderdale. And this is just a, a painting that my friend uh, did, did, but that little passage between Haiti and Cuba was, I can honestly say, the worst of the whole voyage. The ship's head actually went underwater at one point and tons of water came on board the deck. Um, and, uh, and, and the crew were, were, were pretty scared, uh, frankly. And um, I wasn't actually scared because I was asleep in my bunk down below. And, uh, when I went up on, on watch in the morning, sort of half past five, I said, how, how was the night? I mean, I knew it was going to be rough. We all knew it was rough. But uh, they said what had happened. And I said, well, you know, I had no idea. I just slept like a log. So um, I, I um, you know, got away with it, should we say. But I was seriously worried. I thought we might have it to turn turtle and go into uh, Port-au-Prince. So um, anyway, luckily... I didn't. Uh, we didn't. We didn't need to. 
But then we headed for Florida and we had an invitation from the uh, Coral Ridge Yacht Club in Fort Lauderdale, where we, they said that they would willingly celebrate our, uh, our, our voyage. And we went up to Fort Lauderdale and we were absolutely amazed by the number of super yachts with helicopters on, the fishing boats like this, the mansions. We just couldn't believe it. I mean, we've been, eat, you know, living out of tin cans, eating rice and fish for the last two or three months, apart from when we were in um, Santo Domingo. And here was all this luxury and wealth being flaunted. It was just quite incredible. So, um, and this was just, you know, the, the, the crew sort of celebrating when we got into Fort Lauderdale um, uh, as a, a job done. And just to sort of conclude a little bit, we had taken, you know, nearly, um, as you can see here, uh, 6,000 miles over some five months. Uh, we had obviously stopped on the way. But the key thing is the voyage from from the Canary Islands across to Guadeloupe was done without any power. The sailing was all original. We did use power in other parts, but we didn't use it for the main Atlantic crossing. And what happened? We arrived on the 4th of February, 2020. I was getting messages within a week or two from my colleagues here saying, Philip, for goodness sake, get your crew out of America because COVID is closing the world down. And if you're not careful, uh, you're going to have your crew members stuck in America for months. Uh, get, get out of there as quickly as you can. So um, within a month, um, we got everybody out. I got back on the 20th of March. And within three days, lockdown was declared. And uh, I never got the chance to sort of celebrate or tell the story, which is why I'm telling you now. The only positive from my point of view was that I have been able in the meantime to write the book of the, of the voyage, which includes both the sort of the history, uh, the geography and the, uh, and the adventure and all these stories. So um, if you would like a copy, um, they're 15 pounds each or two for 25 pounds. We want to buy some for Christmas. I've also got a few copies of my first book, which talks about the expedition around Africa. That's sailing close to the wind, which was a, another version anyway. Um, so that is it for as far as I am concerned. I hopefully I haven't run too much over time. And there's a good chance for, for questions um, as you prefer. Thank you. I'd invite the audience. I'd invite the audience to uh, ask questions now. Uh, I have just one question that's come up on the uh, the uh, online. So, on average, um, the crew was twelve, which was a good good number. Um, Occasionally, it, it, there were one or two people that came off and on, um, but across the Atlantic, we had 12 members of, of crew. And that's a good, a good number because it gives us three watches of four, four each, so we can manage that. You can get sort of eight hours off watch, four hours on. So that's the ideal number for us is 12. But a boat like this could have taken, I mean, in ancient times, might have taken 20 or 30 people. There's plenty of space, really. It's a it's a big it's quite a big vessel really. Yeah, it's still in North America. That's a good question. Um, because a, you could almost write a book about what's happened in the last two years. So we left the boat there in Fort Lauderdale, um, in the in the hands of a gentleman who, who looked after it, um, and then what happened was. I went back in the last summer trying to find a museum or a destination uh, or a venue for where the ship could be. And I spent three months trying to contact or talking to different museums there and destinations. 
and I could get no interest in it at all. And so I decided to um, have the boat cut up, basically, yeah. and but in, put in containers and shipped back to the UK so that it could be rebuilt, so that when I got an offer for the ship, it could be um, it could be reassembled. And that had happened actually to my Indonesian vessel. So I knew it could be done. The first container was shipped in December last year. And then as soon as that happened, a group in America who had known about this for two years came forward and said, we want to buy your boat, Philip. We really want to buy it. We're going to build a museum for it. We believe in your story. And I said, well, OK, so you can have half the boat because that's ready in the other container. And uh, and then later we'll ship you back the other bit. And that's basically what happened. So they, uh, this group are rebuilding the Phoenicia uh, in on the Mississippi. In It's probably going to take two to three years for it to be completely reassembled and, and, a, and a museum built for it. But um, they're very determined and uh, they've already started building it. And um, so it, it will have a life on the Mississippi uh, at a place called uh, Montrose near uh, Port Madison. So um, it will have another life. Um, you know, so back, possibly. But then, as somebody said to me, I would still then have the problem of where is it going to go? And of course, every month that you have a boat like this in a berth, you, you're, you're spending lots of money, lots of money on insurance, lots of money on repairs. And it's 14 years old, or it was 14 years old at that point. So it was starting to get to the end of its life. And it had been treated in a traditional way. So it hasn't been preserved as, as well as it should have, or well as it could have been. But I wanted to do it in the traditional way. Question from online. Uh, is there any evidence that Phoenicians tried to settle in the new world? Um, that's an interesting one. So I don't believe right this moment there is hard, hard evidence that they did. There are people that would claim differently, but there are, there are some interesting things. So, for example, the Cherokee, uh, as a, a, a tribal group, have Middle Eastern DNA in them. And that DNA, I am told, uh, is traced back many, many generations. It's not new. It hasn't come in in recent generations. It's very old. And it almost certainly didn't come via Siberia and the land bridge. So, you know, who knows? There are interesting theories and stories about, I mean, you know, just to put a final sort of point on it, when we arrived there in Fort Lauderdale, uh, an American Indian lady did a little talk and speech, and she said, you know, what you guys need to understand is she was from the Navajo Nation, and she said, you know, the Navajo people believe they came from the Great Sea to the east, i.e. the Atlantic, um, and apparently at least half indigenous, American indigenous tribes believe they came from the east. So who knows? I think, you know, science, uh, archaeology, DNA eventually will uncover these these things. But I don't think right now, is there any absolute proof? No, I don't think there is. But I'm hopeful. So, okay. um, I'm just really interested in uh, what's the boat's name? Uh, the boat's name is uh, Phoenicia. It, the Phoenicia. We did call it Phoenicia, yeah. yeah. And in terms of sailing, how many sails did you have? Um, usually just two. So it's single single square rig sail, but then we had a storm sail as well. So that was our, you know, if we got a rip or we needed to do, do repairs to sail, we'd bring one down and put the other one up. Or we would just float around for a while, depending on how much work we had to do on the sail. And the sail would occasionally rip. It was either made of cotton or hemp. So it was, you know, it would... Um, Suffer occasionally. What was the rigging involved? Um, the main rigging would originally would have been like a um, 
a sizal kind of rope, fairly rough on the hands. Um, yeah. And then, you know, some of that was replaced later on with sort of more like um, sort of uh, handy hemp, kind of like a fake hemp. Um, so it was, was the rigging made as part of the construction of the boat, especially for the boat? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, the sails, the rigging, the, the you know, the brailing lines, it was all made specifically for the, the expedition, yeah. So, then, yeah. You mentioned you stopped in the Canaries, but that was just like one line. Where did you stop? And you said there was some food for the vaccinations in the Canaries. Like, could you elaborate on that strategic bed? Yeah, sure. So we stopped at uh, San Miguel uh, Marina in the south of uh, Tenerife, right on that bottom, yeah. bottom edge, of, if you like, of Tenerife. And then in terms of Phoenician contact, there's both um, with the indigenous population, uh, they have discovered that there are Phoenician language roots there. There's a professor um, in Spain who has deduced that uh, there was definitely Phoenician language uh, that went to the, I uh, think they're the, Garach, Garach, the, 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 indige, the original indigenous population of the Canarians. Guanches, yeah. So their, their linguistic roots have Phoenician or Carthaginian in them. Yeah. And then they think they found a Phoenician warehouse on Lanzarote uh, that uh, links the trade bit uh, back to the... Uh, the, the Carthaginians. Thank you. Sorry. We have we have another question from online, and that is how large was the largest type of Phoenician vessel? Um, uh, could they have used these larger, more stable ships to get across the Atlantic? Yes, I mean Phoenicia was um, 20, 20 meters. Uh, almost certainly, they could have gone to. 25 meters, maybe a bit more, without incurring sort of engineering problems. But interestingly, you know, I mentioned earlier, she was 50 tons in terms of displacement. The Romans had grain ships of more than 200 tons. Some of them, I think, you know, even, even bigger than that. So it's possible that uh, the Phoenicians did build bigger boats, but we, I haven't seen anything much beyond sort of 25 meters in terms of wrecks that they've discovered and things. So, so. Um, speaking of what you're saying, it's obviously a downward trend. Well, I can't part of you sail off what down real lives. And with those limitations, what would the route back to America to Europe be? Yes, yeah, so basically, Anything more than about 10 degrees forward of the beam was going to cause problems. So you might think you're sailing when you've got the wind just ahead of the beam, but actually you're, you're going sideways. You think you're going forwards, but you're not. Um, so, um, you know, there's quite a wide arc, arc that uh, you can't sail in, um, you know, sort of... Uh, whatever, 160 degrees, you can't really sail. Um, but coming back, of course, they could have used the Gulf Stream to, to, to get back. But of course, you have, would have to wait your time of the season and, and the right time to get your, your winds because they, they do change a bit over the, over the seasons. But it wouldn't, I mean, just like, um, Columbus and the like, you, you know, if you, Climbed it right, you can you can do it. I mean, okay, the caravels were more fleet of foot, as it were, but um, but I, I think it's possible. The other thing you can, believe it or not, with uh, Phoenicia, you can hove to and just sit there in the ocean, uh, even if the wind is against you. You won't really go too far astern, and then you can just wait it out until you know you get your, your favourable wind. But clearly, you would need to be um, 
it would it would be painstaking and you would it would take time to get back to where you wanted to to get so a couple of questions one on navigation you said that you had to each year figure that out about the whole stuff so i guess from that way you can work out that's true what about longitude does that matter to them because they're just using the gold screen and so on and the second question is if they went out to the new world, but why would they do that? What's the interest in it? So, yeah, the first question on the longitude, um, you're right, it's a bit more complicated to, to, um, to, to, to get a good feeling for that, other than sort of in the, probably within the Mediterranean, it was just the number of days sailing they could sort of yeah. work out. But once you're out in the Atlantic, it's a different kettle of fish. Um, there is a story which I sort of believe that uh, the Phoenicians used to take uh, white doves with them. And if they wanted to know where land was, they would release the doves and look at the direction they, they went. Um, whether that would help in the Atlantic, I'm not sure, but um, that's what they, they say. Um, your other question in terms of what, what, why do people do things? Why do they take risks? Why do they explore? Well, it's, it's human nature, isn't it? It's human nature. I mean, these guys, you know, Phoenicians, they were driven for, for, for trade and ambition. And, uh, you know, the whole history is about exploring. I mean, they, they literally, you know, from cultivating the land strip uh, of the you know, modern day Lebanon and Syria and finding it didn't provide enough goods, they decided to be adventurers, to be traders, and the like and to explore and they created this uh if you like collection of trading posts and they they weren't colonizers they didn't they didn't militarily you know colonize an area they just traded uh and they were very clever like that and ultimately of course once they did start to fight the romans into arguably in self-defense that's when the problems really really started but i think human nature trade ambition that was what would have fueled them to go. And it may also have happened accidentally, because once you're a few miles offshore, um, it's quite difficult to get back and with a strong wind against you. So almost certainly some of them might have got across accidentally to the you know, Antilles or wherever. Sorry, just on navigation. Um, on your voyage, did you use modern navigation aids or just nothing? We did, you definitely did have a satellite connection certainly we were sending emails and um, photos back for our website but uh, we also had gps so we, we did know the longitude and and the latitude yeah a lot yeah i mean we had some keen astronomers on board um who knew their stars and the like but uh, and it was quite interesting um to be able to observe for example the pole star and your approximate latitude and the like um, but uh, we weren't relying on it. Sorry, there's something. Yeah, so that. Um, I was wondering on a good day, what sort of speed you make? And also, didn't you were saying this large scale was quite challenging to work in? What you did in terms of creating stability within the ship with the ballast or whatever? Yeah, so the ship for ballast had uh, 20 tons of uh, steel plates. We, could, we couldn't afford the, the lead or the, the tin ingots that they would have probably had. But um, so we had steel plated and then we usually had about three tons of water in jerry cans, fresh water uh, as well. So that gave us the stability and she's uh, basically the Phoenicia's like a, you know, an overgrown sort of bathtub. So she is actually pretty stable. And because it's just that single sail, uh, you're not. You're never really going to be tilting over that much. So in that sense, she's quite a, a safe vessel to be in. And what sort of speed would you make on a good day? On a good day, she could make about seven knots, but that would be sort of top top speed. We averaged about three, but on a good day with um, you know fresh winds and a low or sort of modest waves. She could actually get up to about seven knots, but that's 
it's pretty fairly rare to be honest. Um, yeah, it's at the back. How long would you say you spent between the, the Canaries and making that call and the West Series? How long? Yeah. Uh, it was 39 days. Yeah. What, what, what was the technology that Phoenicians would have used? Um, well, of course, you see the Phoenicians did pioneer um, these huge, great amphora, which they exported wine, um, oil in, and also they brought back this fish paste from, from places like Mogador back into the Mediterranean. So they storing, storage of water wouldn't have been a big problem for them. If you yeah, if you didn't take any water, you'd have you'd have suffered. But then of course if they were catching fish, they could could get, you know, and there's rainwater and the like. So yeah. Sorry, you've been Oh well, that was your that was a, Yeah. I mean it's interesting, I mean you know, you hear you've got to have, you know, several litres of day of water, but actually you probably get away with under two litres of water a day if you, you're careful. And we, on our previous voyage, we did have to, we did have to, uh, to ration it. And we rationed everybody to, yeah, two litres a day, and they still had enough water to wash themselves with <laughs> stuff. So, yeah. So having said that, is it... Possibility that someone prior to these Phoenicians being there, so in the sense that Phoenicians knew where they were going, how long it was going to take, and they had things like a marine the ships. So maybe they were the pioneers of the question. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's a possibility, isn't it? But when I look at the, you know, the different cultures, so you know, there are West African uh, cultures that have these big boats like in Ghana and, yeah. and uh, Nigeria. And there was a 12th, 13th century, to test my knowledge here, but I think Ghanaian king who did a big a sailing expedition. They never came back, but they, they went somewhere um, in these in these sort of, you know, typical um, sort of, boats that you'd get on the West African coast. Um, but looking at the Mediterranean, I mean, some people sort of posit about the Minoans, but their boats are pretty, you know, small and flimsy. So I don't believe that they're a real contender for the Atlantic, but um, but people could have got across, you know, by, by luck or whatever. So... Yeah, did you have the hole and... Did the crew would have had the right size, or you know, quite a lot on a small boat, or would you have the same number if you went again? Yeah, to answer your last question first, yeah, I would have the same number. 12 works really well. 12, 14 people works really well. Um, did we have alcohol? We had a little alcohol. Um, we took some across, some bottles, which I've actually now got back, um, and it's still full of wine. But um, what we tended to do every week, we would do like a little happy hour, and it was just an hour where somebody could have like a can of beer or something. But we did have quite a few Muslims on board too, who didn't participate in, in, in drinking any alcohol. So they would just go for the, for the soft drinks. So, um, and our Norwegian friends, they quite liked their can of beer. Um, they were quite strong advocates of a can of beer. Um, but there wasn't any, wasn't any, you know, drinking to excess. It was just the, you know, probably, I think the daily rum. No daily rum ration. No, absolutely. We should have had an amphora. We did have some empty amphoras, but we didn't have any amphora of wine. So, yeah. Oh, one more question at the back. I don't believe in the ships. Individual enterprise or 
So I don't need any pies to go off. Or was there a central strategy as part of which we push those boundaries off the finish level? What did that to motive individual protection? I think it was probably a little bit of each. So it's, interestingly, the Phoenicians are credited with the first maritime insurance where a group of merchants would get together and if they had a cargo, they would all, shall we say, back the cargo or buy, put 10% in. Uh, so they all had a share of the cargo. If it was lost, they'd, all, they'd only lose 10%. So they are credited with the first kind of maritime insurance. So that was sort of an entrepreneurial approach that the Phoenicians had. But then when you're looking at the voyages of Admiral Haino and uh, Himilco, they are clearly sponsored by the state. I mean, I mentioned Admiral Haino. The, the record of his voyage says that something like 30,000 people were involved in it. Now, you know, you'd ex it would seem that that may be a vast exaggeration, but even if it was 10% of that, these are clearly big enterprises that would be, you know, endorsed by the state. So I think, to answer your question, it's, it's a bit of both, basically. There were individual enterprises that were pushing the boundaries of trade and commerce, but there were also state-sponsored uh, um, sort of yeah. campaign, if you like. And after all, it was... Um, Hainer and Himilco were were um, were admirals, so they were sponsored by the state. And it was very much a sea or, or seafaring trading empire. I know it's, it's not going to go east down in British. No, the, there was nothing really going on on the land side, except, of course, for. Um, um, Hannibal, General Hannibal, who's a Carthaginian general with his elephants that he took um, over the Alps to try and defeat uh, Rome. And that was really the only sort of serious land uh, event or expedition that, that I'm aware of. There may be others, but I'm not, certainly not aware of them. So the, uh, mm -hmm. I really regret that we're going to have to wind up the evening now because we're just coming up nine o'clock and we turn into pumpkins after that time here in, in uh, Queen Square. But I very much want to thank you for a fascinating, a really, truly fascinating uh, talk, uh, some really stirring stuff there. Uh, there is an opportunity for those who would like to read more about Philip's uh, uh, exciting uh, voyage. Uh, he's brought his books with him, and uh, we can linger for a few minutes, but then I will, I'm glad to have to say goodnight to you and ask you to uh, quietly leave. But let's uh, thank Philip and also our audience who were participating online and who sent in some good questions. And uh, there were 14 there and they found you a fascinating speaker. And thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'll yeah, sign if you if you want to pay back credit card, I have a machine that does that. Otherwise um cash cash is good too. So just one other question. Yeah, sure. Sorry, go 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 for it. Sorry, but look at the map of the Atlantic, you've got a bit of South America that sort of sticks out towards Africa. Was there any indication of any people coming over from Africa to that bit of North Brazil? I think that is a possibility, yeah, that the Brazilians certainly believe they had Phoenician contact, from like Senegal yeah. and the like, because yeah. the, the angle there is not... not a, No, it's quite, quite short. Quite short, yeah. yeah. And the Phoenicians definitely got down to Senegal. There's no doubt about that. So. I definitely have a sense from... So, so you sound like the Phoenicians yeah. sort of knew what they were going to. Anyway. Yes, yeah. I, anyway. Hopefully they didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, that's really If you like one, one, one of, of each. each. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I can just get this thing to shoot. Oh, all right. We're obviously in touch. Yeah. So in touch with... Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.
All right, um, thanks for coming. Where else are you born with? Or, um, yeah, Dorchester. Dorchester. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can.